Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here today. Everyone that is joining us online this morning, we're glad that you are with us this morning as well. And I would just like to say this morning, fasten your seatbelts. Fasten them tight. Dealing with living a disciplined life, it's never easy because we're talking about disciplining our flesh. And our flesh does not want to be disciplined. We talked about prayer and fasting. We talked about taming the tongue. And this morning, I'm going to talk to you about discipline with your body. What you're going to receive today is what the Word of God says about how we are to conduct ourselves with our body. I'm not going to be talking to you today about fasting. We mentioned that the first week. I'm not going to be talking to you about overeating or not eating enough food or anything like that. I'm going to be dealing with sexuality this morning. And you all got quiet on me. And I want you to know I love you all, but I'm going to give you what the Word of God says about sexuality. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Paul said, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. We don't get that in the world. I'm going to read on more. We don't get that. We don't get that from Hollywood. You don't get that in sex ed class in school. You never ever get this. This is what the Word of God says. So what you're going to find this morning is this is going to rub your flesh the wrong way. So we read on. He who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It is a false statement for a man or a woman to say, it's my body and I can do whatever I want with it. It's not. You have been bought with a price. There's a car company that advertises car brakes. And here's their slogan. It says this, without control, there can be no freedom. That's true. Self-control is using your brakes or saying no in order to keep your freedom. First point this morning. We go from pleasure to pain. Let's look at Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper just right for him. Can you say praise the Lord, gentlemen? I said praise the Lord, glory, hallelujah, and thank you, Jesus, for that one. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out of one of man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made the woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. God created sex. He put that desire in a man and a woman for each other. And God created sex for pleasure and procreation. There's two reasons. However, over 45 or $450 million will be spent this year on sex education. Most of it will center on safe sex. Listen, there's no safer sex than sex within God's plan. The world's version is not based on God's morality at all. The world's version is, if it feels good, do it. Just be careful. You realize that's what humanism is. If it feels good, do it. So when you have that mentality in your mind, well, if it feels good, I'm just going to do it because I, I like to do it, that's humanistic. God's version of safe sex is abstinence until you're married. That's the Word of God. Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Now, moral, biblical morality 
is laughed at, it's mocked, it's belittled, and it's called old-fashioned. In the entertainment world, you do not see God's morality portrayed. Mostly all shows and movies, they will, you rarely see two lovers that are married. Very rarely you'll see that. If it's not premarital sex, then it's extramarital sex that they have in their movies. Advertising is the, sex is the number one seller. Everything from beer to uh, toothpaste, you know. That's how they sell it. Sex was intended to be a beautiful picture of love, marriage, and family. That's what God intended. That's what we see in the Word of God in the beginning. You have love. You have togetherness. You have a family that comes. Now, in our world today, it's associated with words like perversion, disease, unfaithfulness, divorce. What God meant for pleasure today has become pain. How sad is that? Secondly, the sacredness of sexual intimacy. Sex is not a dirty word. I have no problem saying it in church because it's, it's not a dirty word. God was the one that designed sex. You know why we're here this morning? <laughs> Seriously, you know. God originated sex as honorable for all within his guidelines. Everybody say his guidelines. Not your guidelines. Not Hollywood's guidelines. Not the government's guidelines, but his guidelines. Hebrews 13 and 4. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. I want to read that from the message version. It says, honor marriage and guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy. Notice that. Guard the sacredness of sexual intimacy between wife and husband. God draws a firm line against casual and illicit sex. When a man or a woman enter the marriage contract, the seal of that covenant is their union physically. So when you give away your virginity, you give away the seal of your marriage contract. Singles, I want to tell you something this morning. I sound like my granddaughter she, every time she says, Baba, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. She really doesn't know what she wants to tell you, but she wants to get your ear and tell you something. But I do want to tell you something this morning. Someday you will fall in love with somebody, which is great. And uh, don't live with the regret that you can't give them the most wonderful gift that God has given to you, which is your purity. Remember, you can only give it away once. Married couples, just as the physical union within a marriage seals the covenant of marriage, so a union outside of your marriage with anyone breaks that covenant. Sex is not a physical act alone. There's more to it than that. There's intellectual, there is spiritual, and also there's emotional dimension to sex. And if you leave them out, we lower ourselves. If it's just about sex, the act, and we don't have the emotional and the spiritual and the intellectual, we lower it to nothing more than animals, literally. That's what the pornography industry does. They make women into objects or to things to be used, bunnies, pets, just animals. Satan works to distort God's creation, God's plan for creation. He blurs the lines between good and evil. Satan blurs the lines between right and wrong. He doesn't want there to be any right and wrong. He doesn't want there to be any good and evil. We are living in a day that Isaiah talked about when they call evil good and good evil. What happened last week in the state of New York is sickening. It's sickening that a mother can carry a baby. And if she's going to carry it 305 days until she gives birth, but on the 304th day she feels like she wants to abort it, they will inject that baby and kill it and pull it out. That's now law in the state of New York. It's sick. Sex was ordained by God for procreation and intimacy between a husband and a wife, but Satan has made a mockery out of it. Society has made it into a perverted sport. It's a conquest now. People go to the club, just pick somebody out of the club, let's go have sex. But you have to remember something, God is fair and God is also just. He's fair and he's just. The standards have been set by God, 
And he's the only one that can set those standards because he is the only one that is good. And because God hates sin, God will punish sin. Now, you know me, you're looking at me this morning. I, I don't come out here every Sunday and share on this, but I believe it, it's important. I believe that our children, our young people, and even moms and dads need to understand this as well. Because God hates sin, he will punish it. You say, well, that's not appealing to my standard. Well, listen, when you create your own universe, you can set the standards for that universe. This is not your universe. God never excuses sin. Whenever we start to question whether God really hates sin or not, you just need to think about a cruel cross that God would send His only begotten Son to die on, to be beaten, to be whipped, to be punched, to be be without beyond recognition, the Bible says. And to hang there on that cross, that tells me two things. How much God hates sin. And the second thing, how much God loves man. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. Y'all still with me this morning? If you smile at me, I wouldn't think you were mad at me. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. God wants you to be holy and to stay away from sexual sins. He wants each of you to learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Don't use your body for sexual sin like the people who don't know God. The sacredness of sexual intimacy is important to God. It should be important to you. Also, I'm going to look at the effects of casual sex. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6 and 8, For he who sows to the flesh, or whoever just does what your flesh wants to do, will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. There are effects and consequences to casual sex. First of all, counterfeit love. A lot of that out there, ladies and gentlemen. Relationships based on sex and sex alone or lust, they don't last. If you start with the physical, then you find out, after a while, I don't even like this person. And here's what happened. You never grew together intellectually, emotionally, or spiritually. That was never there. But you started off, and you just said it's just all about sex. It's not going to work. But if you start the physical after marriage, then the other three, the emotional, the intellectual, and the spiritual, will continue to grow along with you. Then you are more than just a sexual partner. You have found a friend and a lover. That's huge. To find someone that you can just go through life with and enjoy. Now, I'm married. I've been married for 35 years now. And you say, oh, is everything honky-dory? I, I love my life. I really do. I love my life and I love my wife. But um, we don't agree hardly at all. <laughs> Seriously. 35 years, we still, we don't agree. We don't even agree where to park in the parking lot. We don't agree with that. And uh, I've come to the place now, where do you want to park, dear? You know, we don't agree on food. We don't usually agree on restaurants too much. We don't agree on clothing. We don't agree on, uh, she hates sports. I love sports. I love to swim. Go, to, go away once in a while, and I love to snorkel. She, she swims like a rock. So she's on the beach the whole time or reading a book. You know, we're just, we're just different. But we... we, we, we when we came together, we came together and we grew spiritually, intellectually, and emotionally. And she was, she's been my friend and lover. And we've decided we're just going to grow old together and love every wrinkle. Can you say amen? amen? Real love is patient. It is pure. It is unselfish. Ladies, when a guy says he can't wait, he doesn't love you. That's just it. When he says, well, if you really love me, you'll prove it. You want to take that as the biggest insult that you've ever had and slap him up the side of the head until his brain rings like a church bell. Because that is counterfeit love. Another effect of casual sex, emotional pain. Studies show that direct, a direct correlation between premarital sex and personal emotional problems. Guilt, anxiety, loss of self-respect. Guilt is one of the most destructive emotions that we have. It robs you of your sleep, it robs you of your peace, robs you of your joy, robs you of your self-worth, and it robs you of your fellowship with God. Ladies, I'll tell you how men think. Do you want to know how men think? There's something very mysterious 
and attractive about the unknown to a man. Do you hear me? Mysterious and attractive about the unknown. Nine, nine times out of ten, once you reveal yourself to that guy, once the mystery is gone, so is he. He'll just drop you like a rock. And then you won't feel like it's just another breakup. You're going to feel rejected. It's emotional pain. Also, thirdly, there's physical regret as well. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, from the message version, it says, There's a way that, of life that looks harmless enough. Look again. It leads straight to hell. Sure, those people appear to be having a good time, but all that laughter will end in heartbreak. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And it's still that way today. Nothing has changed. The wages of sin is death. Casual sex puts you in danger of diseases with no cures. You all know that. More than 500 million people are currently living with an incurable HSV. That's a herpes version of the uh, Sexual disease. 500 million people. More than 1 million STIs or sexually transmitted infections are required every day. According to the CDC, 1.1 million people in the U.S. are living with HIV and one in seven of them don't even know it. When you go to bed with someone, you go to bed with their entire sexual history and the entire sexual history of that person that they went to bed with and everybody else and so on and so forth. The wages of sin is death. The effects of casual sex. It creates a question in your mind about faithfulness. Some people say, oh, it's okay for us to do it because we're going to get married anyhow. No, it's not okay. You say, why? Because God said it's not okay. Who are we to rewrite the rules? You might not even marry them anyhow. You know, you can say, oh, I, we're, we're going to get married. You might not get married. Something might come along and you might find out something that person you want to marry them. But even if you do marry them, you have reduced the chances of a happy marriage because you have chipped away at the foundation of trust. In the back of your mind, you will always know that person that you married is capable of immorality. They were willing to sin with you before you were married. Well, they are capable to sin against you after you're married. It creates a question of faithfulness. Also, it carries consequences. But pastor, don't you believe in forgiveness? Yes, I do. Thank God for forgiveness. But forgiveness and consequences are two different things. I've often said, I say this all the time, you know, in life you can do whatever you want in life. But you're not free from the consequences of those choices. God is merciful, but He's also just. There's two things that will never change in God. He's merciful, but He's just. He's just. Sin has to be judged. Sin has to be paid for, but He's merciful. For instance, let's look at David. David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then tried to hide that by having her husband killed. David had a request to God, God, I want to receive forgiveness. And God forgave him, but he still suffered the consequences of his sin. Let's read it. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do this evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Amnon. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. God said, David, you're going to live in a valley of tears for the rest of your life and the sword will never depart from your home. David and Bathsheba had a child who was born. And that little child when it was born only lived a few days and it died. Then David's son Amnon raped his own sister Tamar. And because he raped Tamar, Absalom became outraged at Amnon. And Amnon went and killed David's son, Absalom's brother, Amnon. Absalom later tried to take over the kingdom. When he tried to take over the kingdom, even King David was pushed out of the city. 
And then Absalom was on his horse going through bushes and his hair got caught in the bushes and he was hanging there by his hair and they came up and they drove spears through him. God had said, because of this, the sword will never depart from your home. It was a direct result, God said, of his sin. I want to read again Hebrews 13 and 4. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge the effects of casual sex. What do you need to do? You need to glorify God in your body. We read it this morning. I want to read it again. It was our text that we read this morning. 1 Corinthians 6 and 20. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Heard of two students who were walking down the street in the White Chapel District of London. And they went through a section where they sold old and worn out clothes. When they went by one store, there was a sign in the window. And the sign in the window read this way. Slightly soiled, greatly reduced in price. That's a sad story of living a life that isn't pure. A continual deviation from God's morals reduces our usefulness to God and to our fellow man. That's just a fact. So what do you do? You need to protect your mind. Everything comes out of what you think. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. I always say, where your mind goes, you're going to go there. If it goes there enough, eventually you're going to find yourself, that's where you went. There are two gates to the mind. There's the eye gate and there's the ear gate. Things that you hear that will stimulate your mind, things that you see will stimulate your mind. Do you know that men are more visual and women are more emotional? So men are are, are affected by what they see more than what they hear, but women are affected more by what they hear. The Bible says in 2 Peter 2, verse 14, With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. Be careful what you look at. I like what David said. If David, anybody knew about it, David knew about it. Because his eyes got him in trouble. If you read before he sinned with Bathsheba and commit adultery with her, he was up on the roof of his house. If you ever are in Jerusalem, we're in the old city of David, you can see how that would happen because it's a steep hill. He was looking down and he saw her bathing. He knew he should have looked away. Because the Bible says in Psalm 101 verse 3, David said, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. Job even said that in Job 31 and 1. I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? So I'll say this, watch the music that you listen to. If the music that you listen to is predominantly lust and sex, I don't care whether it's country, whether it's rap, whether it's hip-hop, or whether it's rock, you need to get it out of your mind. If you can't flip around the channels without trying to find something sexual to watch, then you need to unhook the cable. Say amen. Matthew chapter 5, verse 29. This is pretty strong language right here. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Jesus said that. That's strong stuff right there. Make a predetermined decision that you're going to keep yourself pure. Be disciplined with your body. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, we talked about this a few weeks ago. We read the scripture. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies. In other words, he was disciplined with his body. He said, I'm not going to defile myself with the food of the king." Make up your mind that you're not going to date anyone that hasn't made the same commitment that you have. I say this to our young people every once in a while, but when I was a youth pastor, I used to say it a lot. Make sure you look for someone that's more spiritual than you. Seriously. Find someone that loves God more than you do. Find someone that's committed to God. People, I remember one time I asked my uncle, 
lives in California, how he met his first, was it first wife, second wife, third, oh, second wife. <laughs> that speaks volumes to I said, how did you meet? We met in a club. I saw her dance and he said, they said, how did you meet? I said, well, I was sitting in the snack bar of my Bible college and my wife walked through the door. I'm glad I met her there. I'm serious. Because I knew that she had the same focus that I had. And I believe that. I believe that God will give you the desires of your heart. And he did. Make up your mind that you're going to find someone that loves God more than you. God has a plan for your life, for every person's life. But God can't use sin. He can't. Now what God will do, well, God will take a sinner and he'll use them. After they come to Christ, they repent and ask God to forgive. He'll use those people. But the child of God, be the child of God you were born to be. This is your time. This is your lifetime. And you need to have that purpose in your heart. God, I'm going to let you use me now. Now, you might be sitting here this morning. You may say, well, pastor, it's too late for me. I've already given away. I have some good news for you today. God is in the, beer, in the business of restoration, repairing, and reviving of lives. That's what God does. And some of you came to Christ, and before you ever came to Christ, you might have been married three or four times. But old things are passed away in Christ, and all things become new. That's what I like about that. But i like this morning to share with those that are young, those that are thinking about getting married, start right. If you don't start right, it's not going to end right. I've watched that over and over and over again. God will repair, God will restore, and God will revive. Give Him your life. Say, God, I give you my life. That's everything. You see, you can't hold back from God. I'll give you this, 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 and God, but this is one thing, God, I'm going to hold on to. It doesn't work that way with God. The Bible says this story in John chapter 8, and I love this story, one of my favorite stories in all of the Bible. John 8 and 3. The religious scholars and Pharisees led in a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They stood her in plain sight of everyone. How embarrassing for this woman that must have been. Picture this in your mind. They caught her in the act of adultery. She wrapped what little clothing she had on, and they took her. They put her in front of everybody in plain sight, and she said, they said, Teacher, speaking to Jesus, this woman was caught red-handed in the act of adultery. Moses in the law gives orders to stone such persons. What do you say? Old Testament was tough. They'd stone you for a lot of stuff back then. Moses' law says the stoner. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something incriminating so they could bring charges against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger in the dirt. And they kept badgering at him. I, I, I just believe in my heart and mind. We're not told what he wrote, but I believe that he wrote every sin that was in all those characters' lives. Pride, bitterness, you know, whatever, you know, looking at women and lusting in their heart, da 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 When he began to write on the ground with all these characters, and he began to let them know, hey, I know what's going on in your life. And you brought this little woman out to expose her. But I could expose you if I want to, too. I believe that. So he bent down, wrote with his finger, and they kept badgering him. He straightened up and said, the sinless one among you, go first. You throw the stone. Bending down again, he wrote some more in the dirt. Hearing that, they walked away, one after another, beginning with the oldest. The woman was left alone. Jesus stood up and spoke to her. Woman, Where are they? Does no one condemn you? No one, Master. Neither do I, Jesus said. Go on your way. From now on, don't sin. He said, I don't condemn you. But he said, from now on, don't sin. He said, whoever has never sinned, you chuck the first stone at her. And I've often said this. None of them could. Because they'd all sinned. But there was one man in that crowd that could have thrown a stone at her. And that was Jesus. Because he had never sinned. But he stood there and defended that sinful woman. And he said, I don't condemn you either. Go 
and sin no more. You can't change your past, but I believe that your future can be spotless through Christ Jesus. When I grew up in church as a boy, my dad being a pastor, every once in a while I would see carnal saints. I know you thought they never existed, but there's a few. They're all in Canada, by the way. And uh, every once in a while I'd, I'd see them. And uh, I remember I got to about the age of maybe 13, 14, 15, and I thought, well, God, you know, some of these people are really carnal. One thing when they come to church and there's something else and they leave church, and I said, God, I, I don't know how you could ever have them all go to heaven and be ready to meet you. And then God started to work on me a little bit and said, well, you're not so perfect yourself, son. And I realized that. And then I thought, God, how in the world are you going to have a church, as the Bible says, without spot or wrinkle? How? You know, because I saw all the spots and all the wrinkles on the church. And that's what I was looking at. And then God just seemed to speak to me as a young man, well, I've covered them with my blood. My blood has washed away every sin. And because my blood has washed away every sin, I will have a church without spot or wrinkle. Today when you come to Christ and you say, Jesus, forgive me for my sin, He will wash you clean. That's what Jesus does. That's the mercy and the grace of God. I say this, don't make things worse for yourself because there are consequences. But where you are now, come to Jesus. Do the right thing. You know, we all make mistakes. I make mistakes. I have to apologize to my wife. Sometimes I should apologize to trees that I want to just hammer because I hit my head on them or something like that. But you know, we all make mistakes. The Bible says if any man says that he has no sin, he's a liar. So everybody in here this morning, you got your issues. Say that one more time. Turn up your hearing aid. Everybody in here this morning, you have your issues. We all sin. But we have an advocate, the Bible says, with the Father. Jesus, the Son of God, is our advocate. The Bible says he's our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and he forever is making intercession for us. And when you make a mistake, you say a wrong word, you say, God, forgive me. He'll forgive you. And then go and sin no more. I'd like to have every head bowed and every eye closed, if you would, this morning. No moving around. Respect to God. I know this morning that this has been a rather tough message. It's a pointed message to the point. But I believe that God wants us to have wholeness in our relationships. Because God wants your relationship to work, not fail. God brought Eve to Adam. They became one. They had a family. That was God's design. That's still God's plan today. He didn't bring other women to Adam. He didn't bring others in case something went wrong with Eve. No, he didn't do that. He brought Eve. Eve was his wife. That was God's plan. Because of sin, because of Satan, he has twisted a lot of things in the world. And, and a lot of us have the wrong conception of what love is. The wrong conception about marriage. The wrong conception about the sacredness of of, of sexuality. We don't understand what it is, but this morning, just really briefly from the Word of God, we've shared you what God's Word says. Listen, God will forgive you for anything. Anything. You can leave here this morning with your head high knowing that God has forgiven you and your sins are gone. And He's going to say to you when you come to Him and say, go sin no more. Don't fall in that same hole again. Let God teach you a lesson. Don't scar your life anymore. Let God do a work in your life. I wonder this morning, how many here, first of all, would say, Pastor, I don't have Christ in my life today. And I know I need God. I know I need Jesus. I know I need salvation. If God was to come today, I don't, I don't think I'd be ready to meet Him. You can be when you leave here this morning. It's a gift of salvation that He's offered to you. And all you have to do is accept it. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. How many are here this morning and say, Pastor, today... I want to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, just put your hand in the air so I can see hands this morning who I'm praying for. Amen. I thank you for those hands. I thank you this morning. I thank you. You put them down. Now the last question I want to ask. How many here this morning say, Pastor, today I want to make a commitment to God. Say, God, I'm going to give you my body. 
I'm going to give you my spirit. And I want to live for you. And I want to do the right thing. Jesus is not here to condemn you this morning. He is here to help you today. And to forgive you. I'm going to hear and say, Pastor, I want to make a commitment to God that I'm going to give God my body. If that's you, put your hands in the air this morning. Amen. I thank you for all those hands. Stand with us today if you would. Hallelujah. We're going to sing the chorus of this song. And as we do, I want you to come. Because God's grace is here for everyone today. His mercy is here for anyone today. And He loves you. So as they sing this song this morning, everyone that raised your hand, I want you to come. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should be at this altar, come this morning as they sing.